Hello and welcome from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where Nate has conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those that have some connection to Latin America. My name is Josefina Dominguez and I am an editor for Latin List, a proud sponsor of the Crossing Borders podcast. Sign up for our weekly updates on latinlist.com to get a summary of the week's biggest headlines in Latin American tech news. Nate's guest today is James Courier, general partner at NFX, a seed stage venture firm that focuses on network effect businesses. As a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of four successfully venture-backed companies, James is an expert in growth and network effects and brings a founder-first approach to his investments. In this episode, Nate and James talk about his impressive track record as an entrepreneur and an investor, and he gives great advice on starting a company, choosing a co-founder, and approaching a business meeting with a VC. He also talks about their selection criteria for founders at NFX and how they triple the rate at which they were investing when COVID-19 hit. We hope you enjoy this conversation with James Courier. Hey, James, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Where are you in the world today? I am in Palo Alto at the NFX office. We've got uh, an office in San Francisco that is generally empty. And then we've got a Palo Alto office which is generally empty, except for me. And then we've got an Israel office. Tell me a little bit about NFX. What do you do? Sure. NFX is a seed stage venture firm, and we focus on network effect businesses, thus the name NFX. <clears throat> and uh, we'll invest one to three million for 20%, 15% of a company. And we are very hands-on. Uh, each of us has built and sold uh, big tech companies in the past. Uh, I think together we've built and sold 10 companies worth over 10 billion combined, uh, which I think is about 2X what Horowitz and Andreessen had done when they started their firm. And so we've got a lot of experience in building these companies, a lot of failures behind us, a lot of mistakes, a lot of scar tissue. And um, we're, we try to be as hands-on and helpful as we can with the founders that we work with and we love this early seed stage. Um, and so it, it gives, gives us the ability to have the thrill of, of building and working with the early stage founders, but also, um, you know, get to play with, with multiple people instead of just continuing to build these companies ourselves, which, which we're done with now. Talk a little bit about how you've started to look at Latin America as a region. Yeah. So, you know, we have been brought into Latin America a little bit opportunistically over the last couple of years. Like our fund is only, two and a half years old, three years old now. And so um, we've made probably 50 investments, 52 investments. Um, out of our first fund was 150 million. Our next fund was 275. And, and in the process of, of that, of, of looking around and talking with, with our network, you know, we've been brought, drawn into a couple of companies. The first one was a company called La House, uh, which is in the real estate sector. And Pete Flint, my partner, my great partner, is a, a GSP guy and, and founder, co-founder and, and CEO of Trulia, which he grew for 10 years, took it public, and then sold for three and a half billion to Zillow, merged with them, sat on their board for a while. And, and after that, he, he came and, and came over and uh, joined NFX. And, you know, he was contacted by GSB people saying, hey, we're GSB people, we're doing something in real estate, and we're doing it in Latin. And Pete said, okay, I know about real estate, and I know about the GSB, so maybe there's something here. And we just love the team. And, uh, and so we, we did a pre-seed, and then we did the seed, and we've helped with the A, and and um, we've been all along, and it's been a great relationship with the team. There's been ups and downs. There's ups right now, and um, the company's doing really well. And so we were encouraged that, um, you know, it's time for LATAM to, you know, start to produce the big returns that we've seen in, in uh, Asia and the U.S. And uh, so, and then we got drawn into another one. Um, I had a friend from HBS call me on a Monday morning and say, hey, I've got this company called Zubile. And uh, the CEO is dynamite and we're thinking of putting some money in and would you take a look? And, and I met with her about three hours later and then I met with her again later that day. And by Wednesday night, we sent her a term sheet and, and uh, sort of 48 hours later, we sent her, well, maybe, maybe more than that, but 55 hours later, we sent her a term sheet and she signed it and off we went. And um, Zubile is, you know, delivering uh, service, it's like an Uber for, you know, retail delivery. Uh, shelf, you know, people facing up shelves and delivering stuff into stores and the retail level. And they've been doing um, a great business um, since COVID has begun. And, you know, the brands and the retailers are, are looking for more help. And so it's been a great labor marketplace, two-sided marketplace. And um, we've been really encouraged by that. 
Uh, and then we had a, a, a guy come to us um, uh, named Deepak who, who said, look, I've got this uh, flex port for Mexico, US, and most of the team's gonna be in Mexico, but um, it's the largest trade channel in the world. It's the largest trade route in the world. And, and uh, we're probably gonna have the headquarters in New York, but we're gonna be mostly LATAM and everyone in the company is gonna be fluent in both languages. And you know, the, the success or failure of the business is largely gonna be dependent on our, our Mexico operations. And, and so uh, he and I spent a lot of time together and I realized that I just loved working with him and, and uh, it's a huge market and, and he's thinking about it right. So we, we did the seed there. And, and so now we're, we're in three different companies in, in LATAM and, and very happy with all of them actually. Uh, it's, been, it's been great. So we'll dig more into your LATAM vision and com what you look for in, in LATAM founders in a minute here. But I want to talk a little more about your background. You mentioned some of the, the scars and some of the wins that you and your team have had. Talk a little bit about your background and what are some of the biggest lessons you learned as a founder that you use with founders today on the investment side of the table? Uh, so I was an associate at Battery Ventures in the 90s. Um, and then went off to HBS um, after doing Princeton and Exeter before that. And, and I had to decide at the end of HBS if I wanted to go into venture capital or, or go run a company. And I had this idea I couldn't get out of my head. And so I, I decided to start a company and learn what it was like to actually run one of the businesses before I started thinking that I could be a good investor. Um, and uh, I ended up doing that for, for about 15 years, uh, 16 years before we started NFX. And um, the first company I did was a company called Tickle, which at the time was one of the first companies to do A-B testing, one of the first to invent viral growth mechanics. Um, we uh, grew to about 175 million registered users when the internet was 600 million people. We were, you know, won the web is the fastest growing website. We were in the top, you know, 15 or 20 companies in the world in terms of traffic for about two and a half years when no one really cared about the, the consumer internet. It was, it was uh, not great timing. But I eventually sold that company to Monster for about 110 million in, in 2004, and then started an incubator, and we, uh, or, a, or a studio as they call them now, and that was back in 2007, and we incubated probably 24 different ideas, three of which we spun out and venture backed, all of which I was the CEO of. Um, so it was sort of a, as as many people who've tried the studio model have discovered, it's not really a business model. It's really just a way to find the next company you're going to be the CEO of. And so uh, that, was, that was certainly my experience. And um, we built a gaming company, uh, which did really well, grew that to about 120 million in revenue and then merged that with Kabam. And then we uh, started a, a growth analytics company, which uh, was acquired by PayPal and uh, before we ever launched it. And then uh, we started a uh, enterprise healthcare software company called JIFF, J-I-F-F. -F. We raised $68 million from Venrock and GE and Johnson and & Johnson and Towers Watson and the whole sort of US healthcare crew. And then we merged that with Castlight, uh, which was a public company. And um, uh, that, was, that was a long, hard road. I don't know that I can recommend going into the healthcare space, but that's, that's a different discussion. And so after that, I uh, took a year and a half off living in Europe, uh, wanted to move to Spain and, and teach my kids Spanish. And, and um, as that's, you know, Chinese and Spanish and English are really the languages to know going forward. But um, found out that in Barcelona, they don't allow you to take uh, Spanish immersion. You have to learn Catalan. So we ended up in the French speaking part of Switzerland for a year and a half with the kids and learned French, which was the closest thing we could find to Spanish. And then we uh, came back to the States and, and we started NFX. And the idea behind NFX is to, you know, build a, a, a venture brand that allows us to teach as much as we can, to share as much as we can as founders. Uh, as well as getting in on the earliest stages around network effect businesses. And so that's really the background of, of where I've come. And as to your question about, you know, what I share with founders, there's so many things. Um, one of them is, is, uh, is just don't do an idea unless you can't not do the idea. Like too many people get into business just to find something that, uh, that they can run. And, and I find that, you know, people who are really passionate about an area or a vertical or an idea are, are the ones who end up punching through all the way and um, breaking through the five or eight death experiences you're going to have along the way and actually making a, an iconic company. So that's one of the things I, I suggest to people is be really sure about yourself. Um, the second thing that uh, I work with folks on is just being really sure about their co-founders. You know, I would say that the biggest reason for startup failure is co-founder disagreement, um, even more so than just getting it wrong. Because uh, if you can stick together and keep it funded, you'll eventually pivot to something that that uh, that could work. But uh, if you can't 
keep that partnership together, then, then you have no chance of anything. So um, it's another thing I work on with people. Um, gosh, I could go on and on. There's so many things. What else, what else in particular do you think might be helpful? I think in, in Latin America, a lot of the advice maybe doesn't get, get directed beyond just, hey, make sure you have a good co-founder. What specifics around the co-founder dynamics, if someone is just thinking about getting started or maybe they are six months or a year into a business with a co-founder, like what are some of the warning signs or what are some of the things you've seen that maybe people should have that conversation earlier to avoid the big blow up after two or three years? Yeah. So the first thing I think is just to have worked with this person for, you know, two or three or more years. You really have to understand what they're like in the work environment. And, um, you know, a lot of people do it with their cousin or with their friend from college. And those often can go badly because what you like about them as a person isn't the same thing you would like about them as a partner in business. Um, and so I would be careful of that. And, you know, I, what I tell people is, look, if, if when they walk in the room, your stomach should light up. You should be so excited that they're there. Um, and you should, you should trust them implicitly. You should, you should feel as if they are always honest with you, uh, always. Um, if there's a tug or a pull between you in terms of um, you know, who's in charge or who, you know, how you discuss things, um, that's also another warning sign. So the best founder teams I've seen they will argue through issues together and not really remember who was making what point because they're so committed to coming up with the best answer and not being right. And the best teams I've seen are uh, allowing one person to take the lead when they are most qualified to do it. And, and then the other person can take the lead when they are most qualified to do it. And that, that could be that one person is almost always, you know, the alpha and, and always almost takes the lead. But, but, uh, or it could be that you share things sort of equally depending on, on the domain. But, but in general, I, I find that it has to be very facile between who's sort of taking the lead in the conversation or in the negotiation or in the decision-making process. Um, so I think, I think you have to really look at that human relationship. And I think that there's some level of authenticity is, is required to make that happen. Not everyone has the same personality. Not everyone is super talkative. Some people are introverted and are good CEOs. Some people are, are kind of mean and uh, disagreeable uh, and, and end up building uh, interesting businesses uh, like I think Uber was famously built uh, in the, under those conditions. But in general, I think authenticity is something you have to bring to these relationships because there's going to be so many ups and downs. And if you don't sense that in your co-founder, if you haven't seen that demonstrated over several years of working with them, then I would be cautious. And Drilling down even more in the team, and you look at the three companies you've invested in, in in Latin America, it's clear that all three of them have just really top tier people, both as a background, but then also just as, as people away from the business. Um, talk about the the selection criteria when you're looking at a business to invest in around team. What do you, what do you look for? Uh, the first thing we look for is is intelligence. I think a lot of the sort of failure we've, we've seen and some of the investments we've made over the last, you know, number of years has been people just not thinking things through, not having enough horsepower to think through the 10,000 different ways something could play out and building that probability map in anticipation of what's coming next. And you really need some extra horsepower because you're very busy all day. You've got a lot of people depending on you, but yet you still have to have enough cycles to think through what's coming next and next and next so that you can start making actions today so that you're not in a desperate situation in three months or in eight months or in 12 months. Um, and so raw intelligence is critical to manage through these, these births of, of these complicated, you know, life forms called startups. Um, you know, the tenacity is another one that something to prove, you know, people who, who have a personality set or have had a life experience so that they are urgently focused on proving something to themselves and to the people around them. Uh, we all need motivation, but there is this extra level of motivation that, that comes with being a founder. Uh, I think that, that improves your chances of success. Uh, I would say that we, um, we look for flexibility so that the person can hold multiple things in their minds at the same time, uh, both in terms of their relationships with people as well as the relationship with the customers or with the, with the investors. Um, you know, an investor is being an asshole at a board meeting, but they're also saying something important. Both are true. They shouldn't be an asshole. It'd be better if they weren't. But, you know, I can survive it because 
um, I understand that they're trying to add value and I'll talk with them later about it and I'll be calm in doing so. So you have to help be able to hold multiple things in your mind. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's required that you have domain expertise. Um, and sometimes you don't want to have too much domain expertise because otherwise you'll, you'll start thinking like the incumbents. And so there's a balance there. We want, we want outsiders who are inside enough to know what the rules are so that they still have the naivete and the courage to break them. Uh, so those are probably four things that we look for, particularly in LATAM where, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of entrenched relationships that drive most of the business environment. Uh, and uh, you need to be able to navigate those and keep that in mind while also bringing uh, what is needed and what is new and what is fresh to the markets. And in, in Latin America, as you've started to dig in where maybe opportunistically at the beginning and, and now uh, that you're in the market, what are some of the things you're seeing as kind of the outsiders looking in uh, to start of why it's an interesting place to, to invest? Well, I think that, um, look, I think that the, uh, that, in, that in Latin America, I mean, what, what we don't, well, it's interesting, you know, we don't come in with a, a LATAM thesis. What we come in with is a team and business thesis and then we work with that, those, those partners of ours that we're investing in to figure out how it's going to work in these markets. We've seen such a difference in how different nations react to different products, how the product is built, how it's languaged, you know, what it means to people. And something that might work in China is not gonna necessarily work in the US and vice versa. And we've seen that very clearly. And it's not always the case that whatever worked in the US is gonna work in LATAM or vice versa. And so for us, um, our thesis around LATAM is that it's stabilizing. Our, our thesis is that as <clears throat> the whole world is, is more connected, um, you know, LATAM and North America has more in common than, than, uh, than we do necessarily with Europe or necessarily with China or necessarily with Africa. So it's, it's a good region that is, it is similar to us um, enough so that there are some analogies, but it's um, different enough so that, you know, you can find your own, sort of unicorns and your own big hits that will be unique to that environment. It's sort of a, a Goldilocks zone uh, for us, I think, as we, as we look at it. But I, but I got to say, we don't, we don't at NFX and maybe some other firms do, but we don't have a big sort of LATAM thesis. We have a big founder and, uh, and business thesis. And if it's in LATAM, all the better. Great. It's, it's more wide open. Uh, we can make more of a difference by giving great advice. We can make more of a difference by, you know, giving them, you know, patient and clean capital. Um, and, uh, and we're excited to do it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think you're probably in the minority of U.S. funds that are investing in LATAM that are not doing it based on, hey, LATAM is a big place and it's getting interesting. Uh, more being, this is just an awesome founder I want to back and they happen to be in LATAM. Uh, I think it's, it's, really, it's really smart. Because if you look at the type of, of at least the three companies you've invested in so far compared to maybe some of the other deals that get done in from the Valley to, to LATAM. Um, I would say they're, they're a different, a little bit different than maybe what the, the traditional ones that are getting done. Yeah. And, you know, again, we're just founder, we're, we're founders ourselves. And so we're founder driven. And, and you know, I, I got to say, if you look back over the last, you know, 40 years, 50 years of sort of LATAM experience, the sort of, the booms and the bust cycles have been breathtaking. And so I think to, to come across and say that we can, you know, figure out where we are in that LATAM cycle, I think that would be too arrogant for NFX. I think for us, we, we are really, uh, we, we just have to be people focused rather than sort of macro, macro focused. Yeah. That the boom bust cycle in LATAM is definitely a big piece of the, of, of the ecosystem. And as one of the Brazilian VC said on, uh, on the podcast previously, he's been through five booms and busts five times when people have discovered Latin America and uh, you know, just the ecosystem keeps on, keeps on going. And the way we sort of think about it is when you do a zoom out, the question is, will LATAM have tech businesses like the U S or Southeast Asia or China does five, 10, 15 years down the road. And for us, the answer is obviously yes. So and you're not going to time the cycle, but you can at least go with the right macro trend. That's right. That's how, that's how we see it. And so when you, you mentioned you know, 55 hours to make an, an investment decision, 
um, and and actually get a term sheet signed in, I think it was the Zubile deal. Um, that's not common at all in Latin America. So talk a little bit about how you work with the founders to get to a deal and, and can do something like that so quickly when probably the, the LATAM process is, we're talking weeks or months and not hours. Yeah, so look, I mean, we were ourselves founders and so we have been able to talk and work with lots of different VCs over the years. And our mission is to be a better service organization. Uh, I do not see the venture capital role as a higher role. I do not see us as looking down on the founders. I see us looking up to the founders. I see us as playing a service role. And um, that's why I built NFX with these two great guys, Gigi and Pete, and they have the same attitude. So our, I think our, our mental attitude is different. I, I, we are here to help the founders create what we believe is an artistic whole, uh, which is a work of art that they are going to build. It's going to be their culture. It's going to be their product. It's going to be their team. It's going to be their decisions. And we are there to give them patterns we've seen, to give them wisdom we've seen, to give them the capital that we've able to aggregate. But one of the, you know, one of the important things about servicing the founders is making decisions quickly and moving quickly. And so um, it's, it helps them move forward and get more certainty. It helps them in hiring. It helps them in everything. So we, we see that as a strategic weapon that founders can get from us and we're, we're, we're designed to give that to people. We rarely will invest in 55 hours, but we will try to do it in, you know, a week or two or three max uh, to get on or off a deal and uh, help the founders. When we say no, we'd like to give the founders some insight as to why so that they can go, you know, level up their game, move up what we call the ladder of proof, uh, which is how much have you proved about this business? Um, and sometimes people come back to us a year later and then we invest then because they've moved up the ladder of proof. So, you know, we, we did a thing last May when COVID hit that, or I guess it was in April, April 14th, we started this thing called FAST and it was for FAST seed funding. And we basically said, look, we will get back to you within 72 hours uh, or three business days of you sending us a company brief which was basically your deck, a video of you talking for a minute, and then uh, you know, 16 questions around the metadata that we wanted to pull out of the, of the deck, which is often buried in, in founders' decks. And we wanted to help people bring out the stuff we need to know about in order to, to decide to take a meeting or not. And uh, you know, we had thousands of people send us these briefs, and we were able to get back to them within three business days uh, with an answer whether we would meet or not. And then we would meet with um, many of the folks and we were able to get back to them within nine days, whether we were going to invest or not. And that was a service level agreement. That was an SLA that we provided out to the world and, um, and worked through thousands of, of different deals. We ended up tripling the rate at which we were investing during that period using this method. Uh, uh, while everyone else was retreating from COVID, we were advancing. And, and so that was a lot of work and we were all up until two in the morning doing that. I don't know how often we're going to provide that level of, of SLA, but I, I, I just mentioned that as a way of, you know, suggesting what the bar can be in terms of, of how fast a VC can and should move. Um, nine days is probably a little too short for us to do appropriate due diligence. Uh, but as we make more LATAM investments and our network grows there, the speed with which we'll be able to do due diligence should increase. Um, and so we'll be able to hopefully, you know, get to that, uh, level of speed on a more regular basis with folks. And when a founder is thinking about coming to talk to you with their business, what advice do you, can you give them to be, to make the most out of the meeting? Um, well, first I would do a company brief. Uh, it's at thecompanybrief.com. So one of the things we don't take salaries at NFX uh, as, as general partners, we uh, all of any, any compensation we get from this is going to come seven to 12 years out when our funds are returning. Uh, you know, to the LPs. Um, and what we do is we take the management fee and we, we put it into software and into uh, educational content. And the software that we built, there's two main things that we've built um, other than our own inside CRM is we've built a thing called Signal, which is at signal.nfx.com, which has uh, about 9,500 uh, VCs, individual profiles of VCs. So the investing profiles of VCs are there and um, in, in a few weeks, we'll be opening that up to scouts and angels and, and other folks, not just VCs. Um, and 
that allows the founders an insider's view of who the best investors are at a particular stage and sector. And if, if you live in Silicon Valley or if you've been investing as long as you have at Magma, then, then you know who all the players are, you know who the best person is, but that's generally opaque to founders. And so Signal lets them have that be more transparent so that they can find who they should be talking to. In fact, there's a thing called VC lists on the, on the product where you can just, it's like Craigslist and you go in there and it just says, you know, biotech seed, click on it. There's the 38 investors that you need to talk to. It's nice to have, have these lists so that you can talk to them. So the first thing is to make sure that you're talking to the right VCs. And, and what we say about Signal is that Signal helps the founders uh, find the right VC. You don't want to go talking to all the VCs you can talk to because most of them aren't going to invest. It's not the right sector. It's not the right stage. It's, there's a competitor in the portfolio, that sort of thing. So you only really want to be taking uh, meetings with investors who are more than likely uh, you are in their sweet spot. Uh, and so the first thing to do to get most out of it is make sure you're meeting with the right VC. And, and uh, that would include us as well. And we, we have profiles on there, but we don't, we don't get any advantage, even though we built the software. The second thing would be to complete a company brief. So if you go to thecompanybrief.com, you can complete one of these briefs. And if you send this to the investor before you get there, when you get there, it's like having a second meeting because you've gone through all the basics that normally happen in the first meeting um, and they can get a sense of things. Um, and uh, that's the third. The, the, the third thing I would say is to be very careful about your mindset. And next week we're actually publishing a blog post about this um, because it's so important. Most, there, there are certain organizations that are teaching people to think about going into a VC meeting and tricking them, tricking them into investing in your company because as soon as you get the money, you'll be fine. And I think this is bad advice. I think that the good advice is to say, go into a VC meeting as an equal. Don't be intimidated by them. Don't think they're above you. Don't think that you're asking them for something. Go in there as a collaborator to have a discussion about the business you've got so far. Because your business is going to change and grow over time. And you're coming in with a thesis hypothesis. You're coming in with some data. Start the meeting by explaining what you know about this business so far. Because that's how they're going to look at it. They're not looking at it as, as their business or even as your business. They're looking at it as a business to invest in or not. And just take the mindset that, hey, look, here's the business that I can present to you today. This is what I know about it so far. Let's have a discussion. And so if you've got a half an hour, present for eight minutes, discuss for 22. If you've got an hour, present for 12 minutes, discuss for the rest of it. Many founders come in and they just start machine gunning all their ideas out and trying to sort of think, oh, if I say enough things, then they will be convinced. And that's not how it works, not at least with good investors. Investors want to have a dialogue and understand and push and pull with you on how you're thinking about it. And the fact is 90% of the investors you meet with are not going to invest in you. Not because you're not great or that you're not going to build the next Google or Facebook, but because they've got a different thesis or they don't see it that way. They've got a competitive company in the portfolio or something. So take the opportunity to learn like you would with every meeting as a founder, be committed to rapid learning and the VC meeting is no exception. Learn from the patterns. The VC gets to see all these different companies. They get to see all these trends. They have a purview you don't have. You see things they don't, but they see things you don't. If you can take that time to learn what they know that could help you about your competition, about the market space, about what you're being naive about, um, you're only going to help your business grow faster and do better because you might learn something that will help your business grow. You might get better prepared for the next VC meeting and you might build a relationship that could last for a decade, even if they don't invest in you and you could be helpful to them and they could be helpful to you if they respect you and see you as an equal, as a thoughtful person who's committed to learning fast. And so that's what I would, I would say is just, Make sure you're talking to the right person. Make sure you're giving them all the information before the meeting so your first meeting is the second meeting and then come to them with an open mind and spend more time discussing and trying to learn and asking good open questions to them, the VC, so that you can leave that meeting with something for sure, even if you don't leave with money and it's 90% chance you're not going to leave with money. So you might as well get something out of the meeting. It's great advice. What does the next year or two look like for you and the firm? We are going to be announcing more partners and more principals. We're expanding our investment team. We are going to be launching new versions of Signal. Uh, we are going to be building out more software for our, our guild. We don't call our, our portfolio a portfolio. We call it a guild. 
because the intention for every company we invest in is that they will help other people in the portfolio and that portfolio, that, that portfolio, that guild will, will help them back. And so we're building a lot of software to, to bring that community together. Um, we've been very focused on helping them help each other for, you know, four or five years now. And, and there's a great spirit and a great community uh, within the guild. And so we'll be building software and building out that. Um, and we're going to be, um, uh, we're going to be continuing to invest. About a third of the investments we make are coming out of Israel, or at least our Israeli founders here in, in the United States. Um, and we're even finding Israeli founders in LATAM sometimes. So um, we're going to continue to do that and grow that. And um, we'll probably hire another five people onto the team uh, to help us with more educational materials and more software. And, uh, and more helping the companies with recruiting, helping the companies with PR, helping the companies with preparing for the next round of financing, all those services, that those platform services that we want to uh, help founders with, we're going to continue to hire for people there and uh, expand our team. So more of the same. Well, it's going to be awesome to see you continue to execute. I love the content that you guys all put out. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights on the podcast. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with our guest, James Queer. And thank you to Angel Andraka for producing this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with a friend and give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's the best way to share what's going on in Latin America's ecosystem.